semi-final. This is being organized by the Asia Pacific Young Scientists Association and the Asia Forest Research Center at UBC, along with the Faculty of Forestry and APFNet and the AP Asia Pacific Forestry Education Coordination Mechanism. So lots of different people involved in this. <coughs> The overview for today is we will provide a short introduction and then there will be some welcome remarks by Dr. Guang Yu Wang, um, who will also introduce the judges and we will introduce the rules, the judge criteria, judging criteria, and tell you what the prizes are. And those prizes are pretty exciting. And then we will run the competition. We expect to be finished by seven o'clock. That's because you will only be talking for three minutes, each of the competitors. So the idea here is that the three minute thesis uh, challenges you as participants to explain your research project to a non-specialist audience in just three minutes. So this is like what we would call an elevator talk where you're stuck in the elevator with a really important person and you have to convince them about something, you have maximum of three minutes. It must be a very tall building or a very slow elevator. It was founded by the University of Queensland in Australia in 2008, and it has become extremely popular. So the three minute thesis competition is held in over 350 universities in more than 59 countries. UBC was one of the first in North America to hold such a competition and it has been doing so since 2011. Uh, it's relatively young for the Asia Pacific Young Scientists Association um, that really started the competition last year in 2022. So I'd like to give the floor to Professor Dr. Guang Yu Wang, who is an Associate Dean in the Faculty of Forestry and also the Director of the Asia Pacific Forest Research Center to talk further about the competition. Thank you, John. Thank you so much. Hello, participant and uh, professor and judge. A uh, warm welcome to the second like, uh, Asia Pacific Forest Young Scientist three minute competition. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the APM there, uh, UBC and Asia Pacific Forest Education a uh, coordination mechanism for their great support. Uh, next, John. As John was mentioned, that uh, um, we started in the 2022. Um, it's since the car during the COVID was locked down, um, the, the travel is prohibited, and uh, so we developed the Asia Pacific uh, Young Scientists Association to create that kind of platform. Uh, for communication and collaboration for mutual understanding. So the Asia Pacific Young Scientist Association, we call EPSA, is aimed to help young scholars in forestry with their professional uh, personal development and enhance their research collaboration. This is an open platform uh, for the Asia Pacific region. So under the uh, Asia, we have forest resource management, uh, we have biodiversity uh, e ecosystem, and we have biomaterial and uh, bio uh, energy. So it's cover the uh, three specific uh, area uh, for the our Asia Pacific um, region. So you guys can join us. Uh, they have the uh, website here, uh, the link here, and the uh, APFECM project at ubc.ca has the uh, Asia. And this is the link. I hope you guys can join uh, uh, this platform. Next, John. And uh, last year, uh, it's our first year we have um, organized in November 24th. Uh, it's the uh, same day as uh, as today. Uh, we have um, this, the semifinal. We got 18 undergraduate students and graduate students uh, from 12 Asia Pacific University. And uh, finally, we got uh, nine uh, 
undergraduate graduate student from Southern Asia Pacific University. The first place was given to um, the uh, PhD student from um, New Zealand, and the second place for UPLP, and the third place for UBC. Uh, next. And this year, we have uh, over 350 students registered, um, and uh, 251 students from 21 universities submit, had the submission. And today, the semifinal, we have 28 students from 13 universities. Uh, Susie, you talk about judge or let me, I will talk about judge. So we had a judge. Hmm? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, we had a judge uh, from UC, the uh, Dr. Ines, and we had um, uh, Professor Tu, and I cannot see the third professor here. I had uh, uh, Dr. Ines, uh, uh, he's our uh, promoting and a uh, professor uh, in the Faculty of Forestry. Uh, in the forest management department. And we have Professor Tu is um, from Wood Science, is an industrial ecology and sustainability uh, engineering. And we have uh, my friend Christian Bonacy is a professor from uh, Chile. Uh, I haven't seen him here though. Uh, this is our judge uh, from uh, UBC and also from uh, the uh, our Asia APF ECM member university. So this is the rule. Uh, it's a thing you only allow to have the three minutes and uh, it's one single standard point point slide is permitted. No additional electron uh, uh, electron media is is allowed. And um, not no allow uh, present presentation. I be memorized uh, three minutes maximum. Uh, topic directly uh, relate to the student current uh, credit program thesis. After confirming that the presenter is ready, the chair will start the presentation and display the PowerPoint slide, uh, which contain an automatic three minute timer inside of the slide of the timer. The decision of the uh, adjudicating panel is final. Yeah. And the criteria we had that is quite comprehensive. Um, did the presentation help audience understand the research? So they had the three um, uh, criteria. One is whatever is provide clear background and significant to the research question. And whatever is clearly described, research strategy, design, and the result finding, and the research. And the presentation, whatever is clearly described, the conclusion outcome, and the impact of the research. The second is engagement. Did the speech make the audience want to know more? This is quite important. So the rationale was deliver clear and the language was appropriate for the no speci uh, specific audience to the specific for audience. The PowerPoint slide was well defined and enhanced the presentation. The presenter was conveyed enthusiastic for their research and captured the main uh, and the maintain maintain the audience attentions. And uh, please note video sound quality of live of live virtual event. A presentation will not be part of the uh, justification criteria. We have price. I just uh, thought that in this we mentioned have top five events is a uh, is a one hundred dollar for the semi uh, the uh, semi final and the final price first one is one thousand dollar and the runner up is six hundred and the third place is three hundred uh, Canadian dollar. Yeah, I would like to thank our participants uh, from UBC, Beijing Forestry University, Nanti, Central South, uh, uh, University of Forest Technology, and uh, Sichuan Agriculture University, Fujian uh, Agriculture and Forestry University, Northeast Forestry University, 
uh, Northwest uh, AIF University and Sanxi University of Science and Technology and Southwest Forestry University, Chinese Academy of Forestry and uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and the University of Philippine, uh, Philippine, of Spain, uh, Philippine. So uh, I wish you all best luck. I mean, today's uh, event can be a celebration of the curiosity, in innovation, and a creative journey for undertake advancing forest science. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you, Guang Yu. <clears throat> and we will now move directly into the competition. And the John, first, I, first... Sorry, sorry to discuss, uh, disturb. So John, can you... Maybe I'm not sure that Christian already here, so maybe is Christian here? I didn't see him. Oh. <clears throat> uh, if that. I can join the the panel. Huh? Yes, I think if he if Christian has had difficulty connecting, which must be the case, <clears throat> then we should um, move on. And Guan Yu, could you substitute for him? Yes. I'm uh, afraid that means that we have three judges from uh, UBC, but. Uh, it's a fairly diverse uh, mm -hmm. mix of people, despite that. Um, so our first speaker tonight is, and I should apologize in advance if I pronounce anyone's name wrong, because uh, it's quite difficult to do some of the names. I've looked through all the names on the list. But our first one today is Ala Aldin Abu Kassan. And he or she will present on the influence of foliar sprays with different nutrients, compounds on growth of jasminum sambac seedlings. And so are you ready, Allah, to go ahead? It's a uh, guy, I guess. Yes, hi. Okay, I'm going to put your slide on and you will start now. Yeah. Judging from sustainability and agriculture and resource management. Many of you are still looking for an effective fertilization method to address the challenge facing agriculture. Therefore, we concentrate on the foliar nutrition, which is recognized as an important method to deliver the nutrient directly to the various metabolizing parts of the plant, thereby helping to overcome soil problems. With that being said, this research was carried out to investigate influence of foliar spraying with different nutrient compounds on the growth of jasmine and sambac acetylene to analyze the performance and ability of using exponential and conventional fertilization regime with a specific amount of time for 15 weeks in RO. As shown in the figure one, the conventional fertilization regime applies an average amount of fertilizer from the beginning to the end of the experiment, and the exponential fertilization regime applies different amount of fertilizer at a specific time according to the growth rhythm of the seedling. At the end of the experiment, the seedling with a good figure were sampled to measure the growth index. And the results have demonstrated that treatment enhanced seedling growth and were significantly different from the control group. And exponential fertilization regime could adjust as the best treatment and were obtained the highest value in, in general, as shown in the figure two. In contrast, the conventional fertilization regime ignored the growth status of the seedling, challenging them to meet the nutritional needs, and it may also lead to the waste of the fertilizer. Finally, it can be concluded that foliar spray did not only deliver the nutrient requirement according to the growth rhythm of the seedling, but it can also improve the quality of seedling and reduce the quantities of the nutrient discharge by reducing total fertilizer applied through exponential fertilization regime. 
and maintain figure growth for a longer period compared to the traditional fertilization regime. Question of how much the maximum fertilizer amount and which ones will cause toxic effect and what kind of toxic effect will be made to the seedling by excessive foliar fertilization remains as a major challenge to be studied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you did go a little bit over time, I'm afraid. Oh, no, you didn't. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I can't work this out, Susie. Is that 15, 15 seconds over? Um, <clears throat> we will <laughs> move to the next one. I'm Xing Shi as a judge and Guang Yu. You're keeping a note, I, I imagine. Yeah. Good. And you heard everything okay. Mm -hmm. So our next speaker, thank you, Ala. Next speaker is Lulu Bai. Thank you. Mm. Uh, uh, John, just want to mention, I saw an, a text message, uh, like a message uh, in a chat. Some of, I think some of the uh, the participants couldn't hear, but I can hear it clearly, no problem. I can hear. Um... Yeah, I can hear no problem. Okay, just want to make sure, yeah, okay. So is Lulu Bai present? Could you indicate if you're here? Yeah, Lulu Bai here. I see it. I see her. Yeah. Um, I can't hear anything. Lulu Bai, can you? Yeah. Okay. Can I hear you though? Please keep yourself. Unmuted. I think uh, now it's fine. Can you speak something? Then we check the if we can hear you a lot. Lulu, bye. I wonder if she can actually hear us. That's a issue. Can you hear us? Okay. Can, can, us. Can, can you say something so we can hear you? Hello. Oh, all good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Hello, Lulu. We can hear oh, you. So okay. So are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So I will move to your slide. Your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Today I want to take you on a remarkable journey that bridges the gap between nature and technology. I will introduce you to the fascinating process of how wood and ordinary material is transformed into the functional engineering that is the wooden robotic hand. In nature, many biological systems had been identified to generate large deformations in response to changes in the environment. They can be regarded as a new class of stimulus response system. A good example is trees. During the growth of trees, cell growth, cohesion forces, swelling, shrinking of the cell wall will occur. These deformations are associated with environmental conditions, including humidity, sunlight, temperature, and growth time. Tree growth can be considered as an actuation process driven by these stimulations. As a product of its mechanical processing, wood has inherited the characteristics of trees, such that excellent mechanical thermal properties, renewability, moisture absorption, water storage capacity, and low cost. So we created the wooden robotic hand using pieces of Canadian maple wood. We first removed lignin from the ice cut pristine wood, such that a large number of parts can be exposed for subsequent filling with polypyrrole. Then a polyamide film was attached to one side of the wood at the hydrophobic layer and the nickel-based gel was coated on the other side as the hygroscopic layer. After shaping at 70 degrees Celsius using a specific mold, a strong wood actuator was obtained. The wet, dry, different structure allows the wood actuator to quickly absorb moisture on one side, so the wood actuator will deform and stretch when exposed to a high humidity. Moreover, when exposed to a high temperature, the actuator will bend. 
we successfully constructed a series of grippers and wooden robotic hand capable of grasping objects. The wooden robotic hand is the same size as the adult left hand. The five fingers can stretch and bend under different stimulations. Finally, the wooden robotic hand instead of the human hand successfully caught the small ball in a high temperature environment. We firmly believe that the wooden robotic hand will provide a new method for building intelligent robotic systems and will also open new doors for the integration of nature and technology. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the listening. Thank you, Lulu. Very good. Um, and I should just should say, Allah, you were on time. Sorry, I, I thought you were over time, but you weren't. You were you were good. Um, judges, did you catch everything there? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. We will move on then to our next contestant. which is uh, Zhao Xiao Chang. And again, please forgive me if I pronounce things wrong. Um, who will talk about a battle between an Aries tree and a Leo tree. Zhao Chao, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, we can hear you. Are you ready to okay. go? Yeah. Okay, I will put your slide on and your time starts now. We all know that people born under different zodiac signs have very personality qualities. But do you know what kind of quality of trees born under different zodiac signs have? Are they passionate and positive Aries tree or the confidence and brave Leo tree? Thanks to modern seedling cultivation techniques, we have the chance to test these differences. Annually, trees often go through just a growth cycle that includes Sprouting in spring, growth in summer, leaving out in fall, and dormancy in winter. However, we plant scientists that can now employ greenhouses to initiate germination and encourage plant growth at any time. As a result, we can get plants with diverse starting growth periods, just like individuals with diverse zodiac signs. Since they must all enter dormancy each winter, their development time varied considerably. Some trees had been growing for more than eight months before being winterized, while others were only three months old. Obviously, seedlings that develop longer are taller and thicker. So, what are the distinctions between them? Which is preferable for forestation? Generally, we posit that large seedlings possess great resilience and, and exert a more pronounced silvicultural value. So our silvicultural standards in China is to use large and thick seedlings as the superior seedlings to screen for forestation. However, our research suggests a different conclusion. After our investigation, we found that Seedlings with short growth periods exhibited more dieback during winter, likely due to insufficient lignification. But this negative impact was mitigated after transplanting. Instead, a significant effect of root loss was observed in bare root seedlings during transplanting with root prude. Surprisingly, the smaller seedlings outperformed the large ones especially when forced to the same root damage levels after three years. This is in contrast to our regular technical uh, forestation with large seedlings. The small one has bad root to stem ratio and may offer undiscovered advantages in adapting to severe external conditions. So in this tough game, Leo, the small one win. Thank you. Thank you, Xiao Xiao. Xiao Xiao. Thank you for Xiao. keeping on time. Um, okay. Judges, okay. 
-hmm. Thank you. We'll move to our next speaker, Bishuan Cheng, um, with a presentation, Design Your Own Roses. Bishuan, are you there? Yes, I am here. Can okay. you hear me? And we can hear you clearly. Are you ready to Thank go? You. Yes. Your time starts now. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, have you ever thought about giving your special someone the perfect, romantic, and most special gift? Now, here's a chance for you to design your own roses. That is to change the flower color, flower size, number of petals, and even fragrance to satisfy your own preference. Now, you may wonder how are we going to do this and where do we start to get a customized rose? Now, let me explain our process. The first thing we do is to search for genomic regions that control these traits. And these regions are also called quantitative trait load C, QDLs. And how are we going to find these important QDLs in a whole genome level? We base on a map. So to better locate QDLs controlling important traits for motor roses, we first constructed a high density genetic linkage map based on a high quality tetraploid rose genome and a tetraploid rose population. Over 9,000 markers were anchored on the map and the density of the map had reached 0.14 centimorgan per marker, which was almost saturated. And these markers will be the guide to help us locate key QDLs. So now we have a map and we set our destinations. Take flower color, for example, we first identified pigment composition in rose petals using HPLC analysis. And a total of four anthocyanins, 20 flavonols, and 17 carotenoids were identified. And then we use these pigment traits to conduct QTL analysis based on our genetic linkage map. And the results led us to a 2.5 MB interval on chromosome six, which was related with anthocyanin pigmentation. And a 3 MB interval on chromosome four was related with carotenoid pigmentation. And using these two major QDLs, we searched for candidate genes based on our genome annotation. And we identified several key genes that was participated in flower color regulation. So finally, combining the above results of major QDLs, linked markers, and candidate genes, we can combine different QDLs for different traits based on molecular assisted selection. And using techniques such as CRISPR-Cas9, we can further edit genes precisely to design our own roses in a molecular level. So what are you waiting for? Maybe on next Valentine's Day, you can get a customized rose for your special someone. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, are you going to guarantee that there'll be some roses available by 14th of February next year? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you can sponsor me, if you can support my research. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a challenge. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Angelito Cinco um, with a presentation called Biome Trees CS. Do trees have fingerprints? Uh, Angelito, are you here? I'm a clear. Okay, and we can hear you. So I will go to your next slide. You can start now. Okay. Good day, everyone. Uh, let me start from the idea that no two people have exactly the same fingerprints. Even identical twins with almost identical DNAs have different fingerprints. Did you know that trees can have something similar to fingerprints? Yes, trees have spectral signatures that are unique to each species, like fingerprints in humans. The spectral signatures are separate values of spectral reflectance characteristics that can be used to identify and, de and detect the location of a specific tree species or stand. Uh, the focus of my study is the Almasiga tree, or Agatis pilipinensis, uh, the source of Almasiga resin, one of the most important non-timber porous products of the Philippines, commercially known as Manila Copal. And this Almasiga resin is globally used in the manufacture of, pre of 
varnishes, paints, and soaps. And sadly, in 2013, it was listed under vulnerable category by the International Union by the Conservation of Nature due to its declining population in the country. And the indigenous peoples or uh, IPs are involved in resin tapping and they are required to conduct a 100% inventory of toppable trees, which is for them very costly, time-consuming, and difficult to undertake because most of these almasiga trees are in inaccessible areas. So my research study used drone and Sentinel-2A images to, to, de to, to, determine the, to determine the spectral reflectance. So this is processed through Argis Pro software to determine the spectral reflectance represented by greenish threshold values. And this, thing, this uh, greenish threshold values uh, is computed. So in the slide, the computed GCCI and, and DVI threshold range values were 0 0.36 to 0.45 and 0.38 to 0.58 respectively. These unique values were used to map out the green areas on the map where Almasiga trees are located. Okay, so this is in Southern Philippines. So to end, through my study, the Philippine government can facilitate the inventory process of Almasiga trees to, to reduce the cost to the IPs. So in addition, uh, the method I developed can be applied to map the country's Almasiga resources to inform policymaker if should if it should be uh it, it should be uh reclassified to be an economically important species and and they uh unlisted it from the vulnerable status. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bang on time. Um exploiting every second of your three minutes. Thank you. Judges, okay, have you had the time to make note? Thank you. We will move then to our next speaker, Zhao Fei Dong, who has a presentation, Turn Waste into Wealth, High Value Utilization of Waste Wood. Zhao Fei, are you there? I'll go back. Yes, yes, I'm okay. here. Please go ahead. Okay, we all know that wood is a renewable and eco-friendly resource with great promise to advance sustainability in various industries. But ensuring a sustainable recycling for its products and maintaining its capacity to store carbon dioxide is key. In fact, most wood residues and wood products at end of life are burnt to obtain energy or life to rot in landfill releasing back into the environment the carbon dioxide absorbed by growing trees. The conventional way of recycling wood involves breaking up and bending them together with petroleum-derived adhesives to prepare wood plastic mixtures. Such products are often difficult to recycle further and pose environmental concerns for their disposal. Now, we propose an adhesive-free approach that can transform this world into lightweight and strong structure materials, which offers a promising perspective on second and third applications for this world. The process involves uh, delignification combined with partial dissolution and regeneration to form a strong entangled cellulose network at the interface between the wood cell walls. After air drying, we obtain held wood with a homogeneously stacked layer by layer structure. Such dense structure makes held wood harder than most wood species, and even in specific strengths, is superior to some typical metals and densified wood. In addition, this process can be useful for other lignocellulose cellulose scale mats, such as tree branches, poplar wood flower pan shavings, and withdraw to prepare high-strength structure materials, confirming its scalability and high versatility. Overall, this process could help to substantially increase the recycling rates of waste world and provide a promising valorization and sustainability pathway for it. 
But in the end, there is a reality that must be recognized. And that the practical application of this research is still very challenging and requires further work. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Xiaofei. Um, I didn't see the timer running on that one. Um, okay, but never mind. Um, <clears throat> judges, are you okay that we move on? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Xiaofei. Thank you. No, the timer has now appeared. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next speaker is Jafan Gan, who is talking about forest logging residue is not trash, but a treasure for bioenergy. So previously we heard about wood waste, now we have forest logging residue. Mm -hmm. um, Jafan, are you there? I'm here, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Are you ready to go? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Off you go. Hello, everyone. I'm Gan Xiaofan from Northwest Agriculture and Forestry University in China. I'm doing my master's degree in forestry under the supervision of Dr. Liu Weibo. My topic is forest logging residue is not trash, but a treasure for bioenergy. Have you noticed that there have been more extreme weather events in recent years? Climate change has caused irreversible damage to our planet. And one of the most reasons is anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels. So what can we do to mitigate climate change? Replacing fossil fuels with bioenergy from forest residue must be an effective way out. Logging residues such as branches and stems are often left in the forest like trash after harvesting. But actually, they are very important bioenergy phase down. According to the World Bioenergy Association, 85% of all the biomass used for energy originated from forest. So using logging residues for bioenergy has a large potential to mitigate climate change. But before that, there is one problem we must address. How can we assess the climate impact of logging residue used for bioenergy? Traditional assessment frameworks only consider the carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels but ignore the carbon dioxide emissions from biomass itself, resulting on fire comparisons with fossil fuels. To address this, we develop a new assessment framework. Our framework evaluates carbon dioxide emissions from four sources, fossil fuels, bioenergy, plant resorption, and land use change practice. It provides a more comprehensive ass assessment. Furthermore, to examine the performance of this framework, we define 18 scenarios based on three forest growth rate, three collection intensities, and two types of our field. Finally, we found that all scenarios have a lower impact on the climate compared with equivalent fossil fuels. Collecting all available logging residues result in inhibiting forest regrowth in faster growing forests to produce low climate change impact biofuel, such as bioethanol was found to be the optimal option for achieving high mitigation effect. Logging residues are no more trash but treasure if you could really use them in the right way. And it's promising for it to replace fossil fuels. This will help us have a cooler and greener future. Thank you. Thank you, Xiaofan. On time, plenty time. Well done. Okay. Judges, can we move on? I think so. Yeah. Our next speaker is Wu Chao Gao. And the presentation is on the primary drivers of leaf size differ between C3 and C4 grass species. Wu Chao, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Can hear you, yes. Okay, so are you ready to speak? I'm ready. Time is it starts now. Hi everyone. What comes in your mind when you look at this background photographs? 
the grasses, trees, mountains, the ecosystem, all the thing is true, but we just focus on grasses in the ecosystem, specifically carbon-4 grass species. Why? Because in the evolutionary history, carbon-4 grasses is the most recently evolution examples. When we are talking about evolutionary history, someone talking about leaves. One of the most thing about, about leaves is that despite all the leaves face some basic challenges. For example, absorbing dioxide from the atmosphere using energy from the sun, the size vary widely. So imagine if you were in factory, plants like an interact machine, leaves in this site, like uh, engineering. If you consider investing this factory, understanding this relationship is a total game changer. If you look at the leaf size database for the water wild, you will find temperature and rainfall have direct effects, but not just about climate factors. We studied the leaf size of 2,348 grass species and use, use over three meaning records to model leaf size with multiple environmental factors. We find leaf size is also strongly correlation with fire and soil conditions. Fortunately, we find the leaf size of carbon-4 grass species is more influenced by environmental conditions than their evolution history. That means carbon-4 grass species is highly adaptive and their leaves gradually respond to change their environment. If you are the familiar with the famous book, The Origin of Species, you know that through natural selection, species gradually evolve over time as the advantage of the trees become more adaptive in successive generations. Our models provide the same insights, but instead of natural selection, they allow us to see the inner components. As people often say, success does not come uh, accidentally, it's results of many com factors comes together. I always believe. Thanks for listening. Thank, thank you, Wu Xiao. And you're within time. Judges, okay? We will move on then to our next speaker. Next one is Dehui Yang. And yeah. Dehui, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Okay, so you will be talking about the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on parks visitation. Yep. Dehui, your time starts now. Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the impacts of the pandemic on the global park visitation. I would like to start with a question for each of you. How often do you usually visit parks and has the frequency changed under the COVID-19 pandemic over the past three years? As you are pondering with this question, I will briefly share some of my own experience. So at the beginning of the pandemic with the social gathering restrictions and the closure of the public facilities such as shopping malls and restaurants, um, combined with uncertainty for the future, I was like this little girl on the top left figures was in my shoebox apartment and experienced all the negative feelings such as loneliness, confusion, and even anxiety. And I realized park was one of the only places I could go for a safe outdoor activities. So I decided to take advantages of a nearby park called Pacific Spirit Park. And I did notice the positive changes in my mental and physical health. Meanwhile, I also realized the potential social inequity in accessing parks as well as the disparities of the COVID-19 impacts across countries. So that really compels me to explore more about one, how has the park visitation evolved over the past three years, and two, in anticipation of the post-pandemic and potential future health crisis. How can park be uh, strategically used or managed to cope with the pandemic and increase the resilience for the communities? So I collect the data of the park visitation's daily change, as well as the COVID increase case and death case, as well as the government responses policies across the whole world to build a stepwise regression models and see who are the um, impact factors. 
And one of our findings highlights that the demand for parts has increased since the pandemic started. And according to the table, the various government response policies, such, such as the social gathering restrictions and the workplace closure, had a positive impact with the increase of the pandemic. And our research has the significance in providing insight regarding how to manage park, develop park, and design park to increase the individual and community's resilience and reduce the social inequities. However, this journey doesn't end with data or findings. It extended to a call for actions and applications. As we move beyond the immediate challenges brought by the pandemic, my research invites us to envision a post-pandemic world where parks are not just the respite from the crisis, but an integral component as a public health infrastructure. So as I continue to visit parks, not out of necessarily, but out of a deep appreciation of the ecological services they provided, I encourage you guys to reflect on your own connection with nature and let us get inspired by the potential of the park capacity to heal, to unite, and to build a more resilient and equitable world under the pandemic. Thank you so much for listening. That's all. Thank you, uh, Dave Wee, you're bang on time. Judge is okay. Thank you. We will then move to our next speaker, who is Tong Fang Guo, um, who will be talking about the dynamic pricing for ecological products. Tong Fang, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Are you ready to speak? Yes. Okay, your time starts now. Have we ever propounded the hidden treasures of our natural world? Wood isn't the only thing that's valuable in the forest. Ecological products such as wind barriers, sand fixation, carbon sequestration, and habitat provision provide us countless benefits daily. But do we truly understand the real prices? That's the dilemma I solved in my theaters. Suppose you make a string of necklaces. Different stakeholders will give different prices for it. My research focuses on a forest that transforms a barren wasteland into a vast forest sea. For providers, the first is the direct input. I collected the costs of reforestation and further management. The second is the opportunity costs the potential loss from a no failing policy, trees that provides ecosystem that is a big deal in the log market. Besides, I delve into the imaginary market method. Picture an auction, both providers and beneficiaries can bid their prices. And for the beneficiaries, the next is to calculate the benefits the forest offers to the society. The theory uses the products of the pro market price and the mass of goods. For the government, they play the roles like a coordinator. In the initial stage of pricing, it relied mainly on the government transfer, just like subsidy, with low transaction costs and low prices for ecological products. So it is necessary to introduce market mechanisms to obtain higher prices, for example, cover trending, green labeled products, and environmental taxes. However, they implied higher prices with higher transaction costs. Having collected all these values from many perspectives, I wanted to put them into an evolutionary game model, evolving the government, forest farms, and public. Through simulation, we can visualize the dynamic interactions between stakeholders. Above all, dynamic pricing under different mechanisms at different stages of social development. Thank you. Thank you, Tong Fang. Thank you. Well in time, uh, judges. Are you keeping up? I'm not hearing any responses, so I assume they are. Yeah. We will <clears throat> move to our next speaker. 
Zhen He, Preparation and Properties of Soy Protein Adhesives Modified by Yurushio. It's not just names I have difficulties with. Um, Zhen, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, and I can see you now. Okay, are you ready to go? Yes. Your time starts now. Hello everyone, my name is Zheng He. My research topic is preparation and properties of soy protein adhesive uh, modified by usual. Adhesives are substances that bind dissimilar materials to have sufficient strengths. Formaldehyde-based adhesive as most common commercial adhesives, but they are derived from non-renewable resources and carcinogenic. Soy protein, as a byproduct of soy oil, it is eco-friendly, pure natural, and degradable. So it is a sound alternative. However, it has low water resistance, uh, low strains, and low antibacterial properties. In this work, we find a modifier called Yurushao to address these problems. Figure one is our experimental process. First, we add different usual to uh, different amounts usual to SP adhesives. It is then subjected to some index tests, including water absorption, residual rate, and antibacterial properties and uh, shear strength. We find that the addition of usual significantly increase the residual rate and uh, reduce the uh, water absorption of SP adhesives. And uh, when the added amount of U is 5 W to percent, the effect, the result is the best. At the same time, shear strength first increased and then decrease, and peaks when U is added at 5 W percent. Figure three shows the antibacterial properties of our samples. The uncured adhesive wine uh, deteriorated on day two. Adhesive 2 and 3 on day 4, and adhesive 4 to 6 on day 6. Cured adhesive 1 began to mold on the first day, but did not begin until the 10th day after U was added. In summary, the addition of U uh, can enhance the water resistance, shear strings, and the antibacterial properties of soy protein adhesives. This provides a new idea for modification of environmental friendly adhesives. The above is my research. I warmly welcome both teachers and students to give provide constructive feedback and uh, corrections. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jen. Um, well within your time limit. Well done. Okay. okay thank you. you. Just give the judges a moment and then we'll move on. Okay. Our next uh, speaker is Sony Lama, who will give a talk or thesis evaluating the conservation effectiveness of multi type protected areas in the Lus Plateau of China. Sony, are you there? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Okay, I can hear you. Okay, good. Thanks. Is it Sony or Sunny? Uh, it's Sony. Sunny. Okay. So your time. Are you ready to talk? Yeah. Your time starts now. Okay. Warm greetings to everyone. Do you know more than six million square kilometers of protected areas in the world are under increasing human pressure? It is very crucial to determine whether the protected areas have been effective to conserve biodiversity, maintain ecological equilibrium, and increase climate change resilience. China's Lewis Plateau plays a key significant role in national ecological security and development. To date, 654 protected areas of different types and levels have been established on the Lewis Plateau. However, these protected areas overlap a lot in space. There is an urgency to establish an evaluation methodology to determine the effectiveness of these protected areas, elucidate the tangible impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services. 
and uncover the pivotal factors that influences the effectiveness of these protected areas. In, our, in my study, we uh, employed an um, empirical hybrid approach, integrating the field investigations and model simulations. And here uh, we use an propensity score matching approach, which is more robust to model misspecification. We created an empirical logistic model using a sample of pixels from each protected area in its corresponding control area. So control area is the 50 kilometer buffer outside the boundary of the protected area. So we did this to determine the propensity scores by connecting pixels control variables to their protection status. So, and for the, uh, from the statistical analysis, it was revealed that the biodiversity and the ecosystem services were significantly uh, higher inside the protected areas as compared to their control areas. However, for the sandstorm prevention, the thing was different because it was significantly lower inside the protected areas. Furthermore, both nature parks and nature reserves showed a very good protection effects in terms of carbon sequestration and soil retention. But for, sandstorm, uh, for, but for the sandstorm prevention, it showed a very poor protection effect. So my research provides a scientific support for clarifying the management direction for different types of protected areas on the Lewis Plateau and improves uh, the overall effectiveness of the protection and fosters the high quality development of Yellow River Basin in the Lewis Plateau. Thank you all. Thank you, Sonny. Um, well within your time. Just give the judges a moment and then we will move on. Okay. Next is Ning Li. Who I'm will, here. You, you there? Good. You'll talk. Uh, yeah. Development and application of a food freshness detection indicator label. Are you ready to talk? Yes. Okay, your time starts now. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I want to introduce to you the development and application of food freshness detection indicator label. Look at my hand. This is the sample of the smart label we prepared. In daily life, especially in summer, the food we stored tend to spoil easily. Eating spoiled food can be harmful to people's health and even pose a risk to their life. If we can really observe the process of food spoilage, and determine whether to consume it based on the degree of spoilage. It can effectively prevent people from eating spoiled food, thus ensuring their health. Our research uses catsan, a narrowly occurring biopolymer, as a raw material to prepare a smart responsive film. Catsan is mainly derived from catin, which is widely present in the plant cells. A smart piece of film can be used as a simple smart label that can be attached or att that can be attached to or placed next to food. When it gradually changes color, it indicates that the food has started to deteriorate. Let me briefly explain the principle to you. During the spoilage process of food, such as protein and seafood, ammonia gas is produced. Ammonia gas is an alkaline gas, and the smart label we developed will respond, will respond to ammonia gas, which means that the label itself will change color intelligently with the change of the ammonia gas. Sometimes, I use it in my daily life, and I also give it as a gift to my friends. As a joke, saying, hey, my dear friends, this is my invention. Here you go. This is very interesting. We believe that this smart label will attract widespread attention and application in my daily life. That's all. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ning. Well within time. Okay, judges. I think we can move on. The next contestant is Weijia Li um, with a title Predict Yield Biomass and Carbon Credits of Tea Oil Camellia, Camellia Olifera, Allometric Models, Terrestrial and UAV Laser Scanning. Weijia, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm there. And we can hear you. Good. Are you ready to go? Yes. Yeah. And your time starts now. Okay. Hello, everyone. Expanding green transition and promoting economic growth, one of the key this present see called on the APEC economic leaders' retreats last week, has been raising much concern. Well, how to achieve green transition and profit growth in tea or your chameleon industry? Tea or your chameleon named chameleon olive oil a kind of typical woody oil crop, sorry. And my partner is uh, near me and we are from the same university. Um, okay, I will continue. Um, yeah, we know that uh, Camellia olive oil is uh, mainly distributed in Southern China and has more than 2000 years of plant history there. Despite high profit of farmers and the uh, private orchard ducks face many challenges, such as low quality, low selling price, and slow plantation expansion. Currently, not only is cultivating area, but yield in China needs to be expanding. Therefore, it is urgent to narrow down the gap between demand and supply about tea oil chameleon industry. A feasible tool by discussing future net benefits of market and non-market components to arrive uh, at a present value, obtaining benefits of carbon sequestration in uh, monetary value could provide a basis on the justification of government intervention to improve current plantation practice and regulations, increasing uh, profitability for farmers and even eventually increase tea oil camellia cultivating. There are two key uh, breakthroughs are required in accuracy of measurement and monitoring technology technology and the complex uh, complexity of carbon accounting for maximum utilizing the uh, potential of oil tea plantations to reduce carbon emissions and coping with climate change and the accurate and dynamic measurement of its biomass is of precircal and great uh, strategic significance low cost uh, high benefits and rapid techniques are most essential for tea oil camellia plantation practice Basis on the main tools currently available, uh, including food measurements, molding, and uh, rep remote sensing. The allometric uh, models are common and cost effective. Terrestrial and uh, UAV laser scanning are being heavily used to provide highly accurate parameters for forest monitoring. By combining these techniques, we can realize more accurate prediction and assessment in yield biomass and carbon credits of tea oil camellia. Thank you. Thank you, Weisha. Well within your time. Yeah, uh, 10 seconds left. Yeah, you were plenty of time, don't worry. Okay. okay. Bang you and uh, other judges. Uh, is Christian here yet? No, he must have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you are here. Yeah. Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay. So, Christian, I don't know how long you've been connected. Uh, I've been here. I, I'm sorry, I was in another thing. I, I completely forgot the time. I've been here for one, two, three, four, five, six, ten, ten seminars. Okay, so you only missed a couple. Okay. Wang Yu took your place for those and can share his grades with you. Uh -huh. Okay, I'm glad you're here. So Thank we will you. move on to our next speaker, who is Aokang Liang, um, AI Enhancing Monitoring of Rare and Endangered Wildlife, the Future of Large Models in Biodiversity Conservation. 
Uh, Al Kang, are you here? I'm not sure. Yes, that. I can hear you. Okay, you're there. Good. Are you ready to go? Yes. Okay, your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Topic of my research is application of AI in well lab monitoring as a vital factor in maintaining ecosystem stability and biodiversity. Wildlife has become a focus in ecology composition and monitoring. In recent years, the application of the cloning method has significantly improved the efficiency of animal monitoring. However, common cloning methods often rely on less good size for training. For the real and endangered wildlife symbols of scores, lacking the necessary size bolt. Moreover, with the multitude of species and record labeling, common cloning method faces incentive difficulties in that situation. In traditional wildlife species and vacation tasks, species and birds play an important role. Because of their rich knowledge of species, they can often identify species by relying on only one or two photos, which gives us the great inspiration. Can we integrate and put knowledge into wildlife and vacation models? The large scale model favors that emerged in recent years brought us a lot of surprises. Among which the vision language that model CLIP was definitely the most exciting one for our team. CLIP requires the ability to link image and taxes by pre-trained on 400 million image texted pairs. By combining CLIP's ability, we propose the KI CLIP model. KI CLIP can use the species knowledge of the parents' features, names, and the species descriptions in three dimensions to interpret images and pass interpreted feature scores into an internal net neutral network to achieve accurate classification of symbols. In addition, with the support of large model, we first optimize the structure of Kia clip and achieve a few shot learning ability. Each category only need one to 16 image to complete the training. To validate Kia clip's performance, we conducted tests on regular data classification data sites and wildlife data sites. The result demonstrates that our methods surpass existing few shot deployment methods on all data sites. In the case of wildlife data sites, CareClip can achieve over 19% accuracy with only two training images. A truly exciting outcome. Furthermore, to better serve the need of wildlife monitoring in the field, we aid an criminal learning module. This indoor our method with automatic monitoring and learning capability for unknown species offering significant breakthrough potential in biodiversity research. Biodiversity protection is our collective responsibility. By combining input knowledge and the skilled learning model, we are creating new possibility of, for wildland monitoring. We will keep working and contribute our efforts to test the biodiversity on Earth. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Arkan. You're within time. You. OK. Hope the judges just give them a second. Then we will move to our next speaker, Hui Yi Liang, talking about Beyond Green, people's perception of biodiversity and recreational preference in urban green spaces. Hui Yi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Thank you. Okay. So are you ready to go? Yes. Your time starts now. Hi, everyone. Are you craving a closer connection to nature after dealing with honking cars, crowded streets, and tall buildings? Many people are eager to visit urban green spaces where they can unwind, experience joy, and foster social interactions. And you know what makes the green spaces so awesome? The diverse plants and animals that contribute to biodiversity. As we all know, biodiversity plays a vital role in the environment and the overall ecosystem, but human activities have significantly impacted it, leading to a conflict between biodiversity conservation and human recreational needs. To tackle this challenge, we must link the biodiversity value and the recreational value of urban green spaces. We need to understand how people pursue the biodiversity when they are out having fun as well as their preferences regarding the specific aspects of biodiversity. 
So we investigated the different habitats of a regular urban park, assessing the biodiversity indicators, including plants, birds, insects, and how the vegetation is laid out. We didn't stop there. We also conducted a survey using a method called Visitor Employed Photography, or VEP for short, checking out what the visitors thought about biodiversity in the habitats and what factors got them interested when they were enjoying these areas. Turns out, the visitors totally got the difference of biodiversity across their habitats, and they preferred the habitats with water, loads of plants, and the lush vegetation layers that's taken good care of. Landscape content emerged as the primary source of both biodiversity perception and recreational preference. Additionally, the experts with ecological knowledge tends to care about the spatial configuration during visitation, whereas the general public emphasizes the environment management and the personal experience. Generally speaking, people tend to like biodiverse environment, but the pleasing elements such as water and effective management are more crucial to creating an environment that people truly love. With this information, we can come up with more smart, smart design strategies to make the green spaces full of biodiversity that people totally love and guide people to take spontaneous actions to protect biodiversity. Thank you. Thank you, Hui Yi, and thank you for keeping to well within your time. Let's give the judges a moment. And we will move on. The next speaker is Chan Wen Liu, talking yeah. about tree breeding, nursery, and understory economy in China, key to sustainable production. And I can see you. I think I can hear you as well, Chan Wen. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about tree breeding, nursery, and understory economy in China, key to sustainable production. President Xi Jinping proposed a green development in his speech at the 30th Informal Asia Pro Pacific Economic Cooperation Leaders Meeting and the 6th China International Import Expo. As can be seen from Figure 1, the role trend of China's planted forest area in the past two decades has shown a downward trend. Therefore, it is urgent to improve and enhance the quality of forests. Today, I will take Star Anna's planet in Guangxi as an example for the detailed introduction. Guangxi is the main producing area of Star Anna's. With a total area of 322,900 hectares, accounting for 90% of the country. Fig 2 shows the situation of Pai Yangshan Forest Farm in Liming County. The forest farm is located in an advantageous geographical location with a total area of 34,684 hectares of which the forest stock is as high as 2 billion and 890,000 cubic meters. In figure 3, container thinness of aniseed in the breeding stage are shown, and the survival rate of seedings can effectively be improved by sowing in this way. Figure 4 shows the planting situation of part of the nursery of Pai Yangshan Forest Farm. Through careful camp management and cultivation, the quality of star anus here has been significantly improved. Fig 5 is a photo of the anise fruit, which is widely used in food, medical, industrial, and other fields. When the fruit is ripe, it is usually picked up manually, as shown in Fig 6. This delicate work requires patience and care which is also one of the important links to ensure the quality of the stock anus. In order to make better use of forest resources, understory economy has been developed in Taiyangshan Forest Board. It includes forest grazing model and the forest figures model as shown in Figure 7. 
this kind of understory economy not only uses the space effectively, but also enrich the biodiversity, increases the yield of the store owners, and finally realize the win-win situation of ecological protection and economical benefits. It's all. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for keeping within the time. Okay, uh, everyone is doing very well with the time. Congratulations to everyone. This is you've obviously <laughs> been you. practicing. Okay, so we will move on to our next contestant, which is Afroza Actor Lisa, uh, Hello. who can is you there. Hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, we can hear can you. you. Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'm ready. Title of the talk is UV Assisted Packaging Products, a Key Step Towards Green Solution for Environment. <clears throat> Rosa, are you ready? Yes. Okay, then your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Today, I am going to discuss an important topic with you, plastic, a very common name to us, right? We use several plastic products in our daily life, including poly bags, bottles, pens, even the dresses we wear more or less made up of plastic. According to a report, global plastic production has increased from 1.5 million metric ton to 390 million metric ton from 1950 to 2022. The uses and disposal of plastic causes pollution, which is now a global environmental concern. So what plastic exactly is and why should we concern about plastic? Well, plastic is a synthetic polymeric material that derives from fossil fuels and take more than 100 years to decompose. Synthetic plastics are non-biodegradable, contributing to long-lasting destructive impacts on ecosystem, wildlife, and human health. Therefore, it is crucial that we consider this issue. And this is my study area, where eco-packaging material has a big potential. This study shows how waste materials can be converted into a valuable resource, offering a solution to our growing plastic problem. Eco-packaging materials are derived from renewable resources like cellulose, starch, corn, protein, even the waste products. These products are biodegradable. That means it can break down naturally. I have chosen wood residues as raw materials. These residues are usually discarded as waste contributing to environmental issues and economic loss. In methodology, I have collected wood residue from industry, then treated with chemicals and left it under UV rays. Finally, I formulated cellulose nanofibril solution to prepare my eco-packaging materials. Now you might have thought, why industry will choose this product, right? The primary objective of any industry is to concern about the availability raw material and provide products to people with a low cost and best quality. Green packaging product is beneficial for environment. It reduces greenhouse gases, carbon footprint, soil contamination, pollution, and so on. It can be utilized in paper industry, pulp industry, wood, food industry, toy, packaging, textile, and many more. These eco-packaging products are environmentally feasible, economically viable, and socially acceptable which fulfills the three pillars of sustainability. However, it can be an alternate solution for replacing synthetic plastic. Now, the choice is yours. Will you buy your daily commodity with the plastic bag or use green packaging product for making the world greener? Thank you. Thank you, Afrosa, and thank you for keeping within the time. Okay, just give the judges a moment. And we will move on. Looks like the next person, I just go back. I don't think. Yeah, OK. Next is Harrison Marr, um, who will talk about the re reference electrode cell design for carbon dioxide electrolysis. Harrison, are you there? Hello, I'm here. OK. Uh, can you hear me? Are you ready to go? I can hear you. Yep, there you go. Right, your time starts now. Right. Climate change is one of the most pressing global issues to date. And as a result, there have been countless national pledges to reduce emissions and achieve net zero by 2050. 
Now, the majority of these emissions reductions will likely come from electrifying the energy sector as renewable energy technologies scale up. But what can we do about sectors that won't be electrified quite as easily? The industrial sector is a good example, and more specifically, steel and cement manufacturing, where the majority of emissions come from chemical reactions that take place throughout the manufacturing process. Now, this is a gap where carbon capture, storage, and utilization technologies can put, be put to use. My research is on carbon utilization, and more specifically, CO2 electrolysis. This is where we supply an electric current to break apart the strong chemical bonds that hold CO2 molecules together and turn them into different types of products. The device we use to perform CO2 electrolysis is called an electrolyzer cell. Now we can think of an electrolyzer cell like one big sandwich. On either side, acting as the bread and pushing everything together are our flow plates that supply reactants to the cell, like CO2 gas and liquid electrolyte. We then have two electrodes, a cathode and an anode, where chemical reactions like CO2 conversion take place. In between these, we have a membrane that facilitates the flow of ions throughout the cell. Now, when we supply an electric current to our cell, one thing we want to know is how much energy it takes to drive our chemical reactions. We do this by measuring the full cell voltage, and that is the voltage difference between the cathode and the anode. However, during operation, the voltages on the cathode and the anode are constantly changing due to all the chemical reactions taking place. However, <clears throat> this is where we can use, oh, sorry, but our full cell voltage tells us nothing about these individual changes, just the difference between the two. This is where we can use a reference electrode, which is a third electrode we can insert into our cell that helps us decouple the voltages on the anode and the cathode and gives us a better understanding of the energy lost throughout our cell. However, using reference electrodes in practice can be quite difficult, can have unwarranted side effects such as membrane dehydration, which can lead to cell failure. Our group has set out to address this issue by designing a reference electrode that continuously circulates liquid electrolyte to the point of contact between the reference electrode and the membrane. By increasing membrane hydration in this way, we hope to prolong the testing periods of CO2 electrolysis that incorporate reference electrodes, which will allow us to study the long-term stability of CO2 electrolysis materials, which will be essential for scaling the technology into the future. Now, if we hope to decarbonize our entire economy, we'll need a variety of different options available to us. CO2 electrolysis is just one option, specifically in hard to decarbonize sectors. And by producing more effective research tools, we can more quickly identify gaps in knowledge, which will allow us to create more energy efficient and economical CO2 electrolyzers for carbon utilization. Thank you. Thank you, Harrison. You were well within time. Just give the judges a second. Okay, we will move to the next person, which is John David Pillapil, and the title It's In Our Water, Microbial Presence as a Tool in Fighting Future Pandemics. John, are you there? I uh, am clear. You're there. Okay, and we can hear you. Are you ready to go? Yes, I am. Right. Your time starts now. In a few weeks' time, it's already been four years since the COVID-19 pandemic started, a nightmare that changed our lives more than we can ever imagine. Several lockdowns and 700 million cases that resulted to almost 7 million lives of families and friends that we lost forever. But what if I tell you that this could have been mitigated with the help of a cost-effective and sustainable surveillance tool that could have provided more accurate information about the disease spread. And that solution I'm talking about just lies in our waters. The COVID-19 causing virus, namely SARS-CoV-2, primarily infects our body by targeting and attaching to a specific protein called ACE2. This uh, target protein can be found in several parts of our body, and a lot of them are in our guts. This makes the virus detectable uh, in fecal matter, and this is what we take advantage of to fight back. Whether COVID-19 patients exhibited symptoms or not, the feces contain detectable loads of the virus, which ultimately end up in our wastewater. And fortunately, the risk of infection, once they reach our waters, it's very unlikely, but the virus uh, persists and leaves remnants of its genetic material that lasts for days to weeks. These remnants are what we take advantage of and analyze, allowing us to detect their presence within a certain perimeter using fewer samples, making this approach cheaper, more sustainable, 
and uh, the only source of accurate information about the true state of disease spread, because uh, as it provi- as it also covers the undetectable by the cl- or unreported by the clinics. Our findings have shown that aside from the from detecting the presence of the virus, uh, this approach also allows us to de- find out the changes in its biology, which results in the formation of different variants, drug resistance, and the changes in the route and how fast these virus uh, spread. By taking advantage of such a vast amount of information uh, a water sample can give, we compared uh, this to the clinical surveillance uh, that uh, used during the uh, peak of the pandemic and found out that wastewater monitoring would have helped us predict which variants would prevail two weeks earlier. Sadly, this wastewater-based forecast uh, could have given us the accurate information we needed to mitigate the uh, the losses, the damages we experience. But we know better now. Now that we have finally changed the course of this pandemic, let's bring this learnings, this discoveries with us towards a pandemic-proof future. Thank you. Thank you, uh, John. Just give the judges a moment. Okay. We will move to the next person, which is Hong Shu Pu, a protective mixture based on moss for stone cultural relics. Hong Shu, are you here? Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can yes, hear me. Okay. And see you. Um, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Your time starts now. Okay, um, imagine a situation that you put your valuable things outside for a couple of years. Uh, what will happen then? It's not hard for you to see the answer and to see how bad the environment do to it. So it is the same when we talk about the stone cultural relics outside. Considering most of them are very big, so it's hard to cover all the surface and build a shelter for them. What we need right now is a kind of material which can put on the surface of the stone and protect them and keep them away from the environmental factors. And this is what I want to solve. So by the time we do a cleaning to the stone relics outside, I found a very, very interesting phenomenon. The surface with moss uh, were less deteriorated than those without moss. So I started to think, how about use moss to protect the surface of the stone? But we all know that naturally grown moss can do damage to the surface of the stone because it's a uh, rhizoids, um, which you can call it the fake root, will firmly attach on the surface of the stone and grow along with the cracks then into the surface of the stone and finally break the surface apart. So the question becomes to how to let the fake root stay away from the surface or just on the surface, not get inside uh, into the cracks. So my solution is by selecting the specific spore species and with the right mix of substrates and the uh, adhesive, uh, which you can see is bioglue, and I can let the fake roots in uh, the blue area, which you can see on the slide. Uh, they are the substrates and uh, the bioglue. So thus, the roots will no longer get inside the surface. And also the substrate and bioglue will neutralize the acid produced by the moss. So by spreading this a mixture on the surface of the stone, a uh, film uh, made of the moss will be formed and keep the stone relics away from environmental factors like acid, rain, wind, and sad. Since already knew the mixture, the right ratio of the ingredients in it, so it can be easily washed off by gel, a water-based gel remover. At present, the different uh, mixture for different stone is different. <laughs> so the correct ratio and the uh, suitable species for each type of stone are still being tested. But I do hope my work can help to protect the stone relics outside um, in the future. Thank you, that's all. Thank you, Hong Shu. We'll just give the judges a moment. The next speaker is Xuo Yang, 
And the title is Unveil the Mystery of Forest Understory Structure. Sho, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Maybe we can hear you and we can see you. Okay, are you ready thank to go? You. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, your time starts now. Okay. On my first field trip with my daughter, I tore my trousers on a bush. Suddenly, it made me realize that despite studying forestry for a really long time, I tended to focus solely on the emergent or canopy layer of the forest and neglecting the endostory layer, which also plays an essential role in the forest ecosystems. I was really curious, as it is a crucial component of the forest, then why the previous study in this domain has been relatively scarce. As our research progressed, we gradually discovered that there is no comprehensive method to access the endostory vegetation information at the large scales. Imagine that we are soaring like eagles right above the canopy, and but we cannot find our prey underneath, um, well, because of the dense trees. So that we are really eager to unveil the mystery of the endostory. And well, although it appears to be a really challenging problem, may I attempt it? It is possible. And how can I accomplish this? I firmly believe that the advanced equipment and innovative algorithms can help us to en enable the resolution. And the LIDAR as a remote sensing sensor can measure in three dimensions and a signal can accurately reflect the energy vertical distribution when influenced by the forest vertical structure, just like the picture on the left. And essentially, this involves the radiative transfer of the photons. Well, and let's look at the middle picture. We then conducted a simplified modeling of the forest, uh, of the forest scenario. And we introduced an energy-based dichotomy model, which based on the radiative transfer theory. And after we solving the technical issues, we successfully extract the endostory gap fraction, just as shown in, in the red figure, which is a really crucial indicator that indicates the vegetation structure. And we are really delighted with our achievement. And during our interaction with some um, ecologists and foresters, they expressed great excitement that we have resolved a challenging problems that they have struggled with and expected implementing our method in their forest carbon stocks, well, and endostory and soil and water conservation research. And from this, I gradually realized that always being curious and study and thinking from the tiny things is a really significant driving force for our innovation. Uh, okay, thank you for your listening. Thank you, Shua. You are within time. Well done. Um, we will move to the next speaker, Yang Yang, uh, who will talk about preparation and performance optimization of carbon-based emitter. And I'll go on to mute because of my dogs. Yang Yang, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Your time starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. I'm excited to share my research on the developments of a carbon-based emitter, a greenhouse gas emission mitigation. Why do we need this? In China, the annual production of crop straw has reached 700 million tons. Unfortunately, the traditional practice of burning is for fuel not only pollutes the environment, but wastes natural resources and places huge pressure on the soil ecosystem. As an alternative, researchers have explored an innovative approach to comprehensive utilized straw by employing it as a raw material for biochar. What is the biochar? Biochar is the product of heated biomass residue. It's essentially fertilizer. The application of biochar to farmland has many benefits, including soil improvement, greenhouse gas emission mitigation, carbon fixation, and environmental remediation. However, it is difficult to fully meet crop growth requirements by applying biochar to dry farmland. So additional irrigation measures must be implemented during the dry season. For example, irrigation uses ceramic mixture, which outflow like humans white, 
sipping water outward through macropods. Look at figure two. This is the preparation process of a carbon-based mixer. It couples crop straw, belcha, and ceramic mixer to prepare the carbon-based mixer by methods known as compression molding and sintering. It combines their advantages to achieve irrigation, soil improvements, and the utilization of crop straw. It is formalized. The forest of the carbon-based mixer decreases over time, reaching a stable value at different sinking temperature. The stable value eventually reached 0.87 liters per hour after it reaches its service life, crushes the carbon-based mixer directly back to the field, which increases the soil porosity and organic matter content. The field capacity increased by 22.5% compared to original soil. As had as earlier, the implementation of a carbon-based mixer not only conserves invaluable resources, but also holds promise for border utilization, imagery leading to an improved quality of life. Thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Yang. So uh, just give the judges a moment. You're well within time, well done. Okay, we will uh, move on. Our next speaker is Zheng Yang, otherwise known as Jason Yu. Zheng Yang, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank okay, you. I will. Are you ready to go? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, your time starts now. Okay. So, throughout the 4.5 billion years of the Earth's existence, nature has gone through a remarkable evolution, solving numerous challenges along the way. I always find inspirations in those nature design biomaterials. By mimicking nature, we can create materials with not only the biocompatibility, but also functionally efficient and well-designed structures. Having spent over seven years in the faculty of forestry, I often observe this small creature named the wasp. They're always chewing wood, despite the wood not being their food. These creatures, like skilled architects, chew the wood into smaller pieces and use the fibers to construct their nest. From outside, their nest appeared like a basketball. However, while we look inside, we discover the complexity within, like thousands of honeycomb structures were built up layer by layer. How can we mimic this process in our lab to create materials that are both strong and lightweight? So with this inspiration, I realized a similar design in our lab. We can extract cellulose fibers from trees just like the wasp does. But you know what? We can do even better. We can keep breaking fibers down into microfibers and then even the nanoscale fibers using the chemicals and advanced tools. As researchers, we set out to construct advanced structures using a technique that is quite similar to the wasp's building process, which is 3D printing. This method allowed us to create honeycomb structures that are incredibly light, yet strong. We already successfully made such a structure so delicate that it can rest on top of a dentline, while it magically owns the strength to support the weight of a 6.8 kilogram kettlebell, which is over 16,000 times of its own weight. Our effort has also yielded a variety of exceptional materials, such as this rubbery octopus, that is both robust and also stretchable. Also, we have created foam materials and another strong material, which may be able to replace the plastic in the near future. Right now, I consider myself a wasp in the lab. In the pursuit of the sustainable and innovative biomaterials, I hope to contribute to a future where we can live in the spaces constructed with the brilliance that nature has already shown us. Thank you for listening. That's all. Thank you, Jason. You are well within your time. Well done. Okay. 
just give the judges a second. And we move on to the next speaker, Jixing Yu, talking about mixed plantations have more soil carbon sequestration benefits than pure plantations in China. Jixing, are you there? Hi, Professor. I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? I can hear you and I can see you. Are you ready yeah. to go? Yeah. Okay. Your time starts now. Globally, carbon emission is an important issue. The increase in atmospheric carbon is the biggest contributor to climate change. If the temperature continues to rise in accordance with carbon dioxide levels, then we are going through some dramatic changes to our habitats. So what is the key to reversing the damage? Well, it's restoring Earth's delicately balanced carbon cycle. Soil carbon sequestration is, a, is an important factor in combating climate change. It refers to the storage of carbon that has the immediate potential to become carbon dioxide gas. Mixed plantation and the pure plantation are two of our station modes in practice which make great contributions to carbon sinks in afforestation in ecosystems. However, there's a problem. What were the differences in carbon sequestration rates between different afforestation modes? Well, to solve the problem, I conducted a synthesis based on 218 observations in China. The results were amazing. Mixed plantations preserved more soil carbon sequestration than pure plantation. The carbon sequestration rates of mixed plantations were 0 0.89 megagram per hectare per year, and the pure plantations were 0 0.32 megagram per hectare per year. Particularly, the carbon sequestration rates of upper swab mixtures was the highest among all mixed plantation modes. It was 0 0.97 megagram per hectare per year. Moreover, a forest or cropland had a higher sequestration rate compared to that of barren lands or woodland. Compared with high temperature and the high precipitation environments, a forestation of low temperature and the low precipitation environments has the higher carbon sequestration rates. Overall, mixed plantations should be taken into account in future afforestation projects in the view of improving the carbon dioxide levels. That's all. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jijing. Well Thank within you. your time. Just give the judges a second or two. Okay. Our next speaker is Zhu Qi Xiao. I hope I pronounced yes. that roughly right. Zhu Qi, are you yeah, there? I'm here. Yeah, the I'm here. Can you hear can me? Solve... Yeah, we can hear you. The title is Can Saw Fungi Be Successfully Colonized? Wood Talks. So are you ready? Yeah, sure. Okay, then your time starts now. Hello everyone, picture it. Walking in the forest with leaves crunching under foot and the falling branches scarlet around. These are not just the random wood pieces. They are the nature's magic recycling boxes turning decay into nourishment. And the wizard behind the process, fungi, literally break down wood benefited the whole forest ecosystem. Now, a curious thought, where do these fungi originated? Predominantly from the soil. But here's a twist. The type of the tree the wood comes from seems to play a role. It seems different tree species invited different fungi gas. Transition from soil to wood isn't that easy, especially tree species comes into play. And our human activities just like nitrogen and phosphorylation seems to challenge the fungi's nature roles. 
So how do we uncover our forest secrets? Imagine a big outdoor experiment. Deep in the beautiful China of Zhejiang, we turned a piece of forest into our research zone. We added a bit of this and a bit of that, just like a chief experiment in a new recipes. We added some nitrogens, some phosphorus, sometimes both to see how they affect our fungi gas. And we also looked at a different tree species to see if there's any differences in how they react. In fact, we sampled dead wood and the surrounding soil and extracted the DNA from the samples and measured the fungi in them. So what do we found in our study? First, there was about 25% to 15% fungi can traced from the soil fungi. And the colonization isn't random, it's deeply influenced by the tree species and they respond differently to the nutrient additions as a result of the inherent nutrient conditions. Furthermore, we found that the clonized fungi are more sensitive to phosphor additions in gymnosperms and more sensitive to nitrogen additions in angiosperms. The relationships between fungi, deadwood, and nutrient highlights the delicate balance in the forest ecosystem. This has important implications for the dynamic of fungi community establishment and wood decomposition rates under the increasing global changes in the future. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Zhuxi. Just give the judges a moment. You were well within your time. Okay. We will move on to the next speaker, Min Zhu. Yeah. Can You're you there. Hear me? You can hear you. So your talk is called Lure It and Kill It, the Natural Pest Sniper Battle. Are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay. You. Then your time starts now. Well. In the process of long-term coevolution between plants and insects, plants have gradually formed a chemical defense system dominated by cellular metabolites, which important, important of which is the release of volatile organic compounds. Before contacting the plants host plants, insects will detect and identify the plants by using the chemical receptors of antenna and make the corresponding, corresponding behavior choices according to the obtained information. Tea plant is a very important catch crop in China, which has a remarkable nutritional and economic value. In recent years, tea green leaf hopper has occurred frequently in tea garden, which often leads to more than 50% of tea year damage in large years. And the annual control cost accounts for more than 60% of the total control cost. By releasing volatiles, plants can not only reduce the number of plants, but also warn the neighboring plants, which can quickly improve the expression of insect-resistant genes and the synthesis of defense resistant substance and enter the primary st state, causing direct and indirect defense. In our research, the research showed that C3 hasner is a kind of big ground odor in tea garden, which is released when suffered from mechanically damaged and chewed by insects. But the sucking of tea green leaf Cooper cannot cause the production of this substance. So the white tube oil factor experiment, we found that C3 Hessner at 10 to the minus square gram per milliliter has a real attractive behavior to leaf hoopers. And the EHS also shows that it has a strong electro antenna gram response to leaf hoopers. Then we added to 10% sucrose water for artificial feeding and found that it had a real ladder effect on leaf hoopers. Of the six hours, it was close to 100% mortality to the, at the 0 0.1 gram per milliliter treatment. But how to explain this phenomenon? Our speculation is that C3 Hessner is mainly released from the leaves of plants, while the hoppers mainly feed on the tender shoots of tea. And the chemical property of C3 Hessner is very unstable and easily converted into its isomers, such as C3 Hessner and C3 Hessner. State. So when the leaf hoopers smells and feeds, Cisaster Asner cannot exist anymore. Just like the figure shoes, hmm, this smells good, but not testing. Bye. So in summary, our research has provided a new insight 
and a strategy for pest control in tea gardens. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Min. As you were in time. Okay, just give the judges a second. I'll write down their notes. Okay, we move on to the next speaker, which is Yunji Zhu. A study on the relationship between service quality and tourist behavior intention in forest healthcare tourism destinations. Yunzi, are you there? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you. Okay. Uh, are you ready to go? Yeah. Okay, your time starts now. Dear professors, my topic is a study on the relationship between service quality and tourist behavioral intention in forest health care destinations. At present, the celebrated pace of life has made more and more people in a safe healthy state. In this context, forest health tourism, which is based on the concept of great health, came into being. China's forest health tourism is in the initial stage of development and lacks market competitiveness. And behavior intention of forest health tourists has become the key to the sustainable development of forest health tourism. Therefore, this paper takes behavioral intention to the starting point to carry out research. Based on the cognition, theory of cognition, emotion, intention, relationship and the theory of self-regulated attitude. Firstly, it constructs the theoretical model about service quality, local attachment, satisfaction, and behavior intention. Secondly, the measurement items of these four variables in the theoretical model are constructed. And the forest health tourism base of Yunnan province is taken as an example. Finally, the collected data is analyzed using AMOS and other software. The results show that owning forest quality has significant positive effect on tourist behavioral intention in the three dimensions of service quality. Local dependence, local identity, and satisfaction have a partial or completed mediating role. The two dimensions of Local attachment have significant positive impact on satisfaction and be tourist behavioral intention. That's my speech. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well within your time. You had over a minute to go. Okay. Uh, just give the judges a moment. And we... We have finished. You were the last... Speaker, Yunji. Um, so I'm going to hand the screen back to the group. And uh, Susie, what is the procedure now? Okay, can you uh, keep on around the slides? There's still some of slides after this presentation. Yeah. You want me to go back, share yeah. the screen? Yes. Okay. So that's the uh, announcement for our finals. We will have our final uh, on December 8th, also 5 o'clock uh, uh, in Vancouver time. Uh, so we will announce the re final results as soon as possible by emails. So you will get uh, the results later. Okay, like slides. Okay, that's all. Yeah, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you for uh, for the all the competitors. I think you did a uh, quite good job, much better than I view your uh, videos. I think. Yeah, thank you all the judges. And uh, after this, um, so I will close the. Zoom meeting for everyone, but for the judges, could you please re-enter the same uh, Zoom meeting so we will have a closed door meeting to discuss the final results.